how did you get into this? Becoming well, an investigative journalist and becoming a writer and just doing the work that you're doing. So I actually started off as a writer. That's that's all I wanted to, to do. That's all I wanted to be. Um, the first time I ever got any kind of re recognition for something that I wrote was in 2006. Um, there used to be a global essay competition called the the, uh, the Royal Commonwealth Society's Right Around the World Essay Competition. And I was 16 at the time in Sixth Form College in Lagos. And I put in an entry and I came third worldwide in this thing. Um, at the time, I was still, I was studying like, you know, because in the Nigerian family, you're supposed to study something like, like STEM or like commercial, you know, a serious course. So it's physics. It's chemistry, biology, it's math. You know, that's what you're supposed to do at that age. So that's, that's the combination I was doing at the time. And I was very unhappy because I, I was more of a social science person. But obviously my family didn't know what, <laughs> what the hell that was. So when I was preparing to go up to university, uh, I was going to university in the UK. Um, I, filled, I filled in my UCAS form and I filled in business management. And I went to meet my favorite teacher, a guy called Mr. Kule. He was my English teacher. And I asked him for a reference, to write a reference for me. And he said, why would you study business management? That you're a very good writer and you write a lot. Why don't you just do what you're good at? And you know that one of those moments where somebody just changed your life, but they don't realize it. Because that single sentence that he made is the reason why I'm having this conversation with you today. That was in 2007, no, 2006, when he made that comment. So... Uh, I went back and I changed my 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 uh, program instead of business management. I decided that I wanted to do journalism because I I figured, look, how else am I going to make a living out of writing? It has to be journalism. And obviously, my parents did not understand it. My parents were like, "Hell no, hell no!" We're like, how on earth were, are we going to spend like twelve, fifteen thousand pounds annually to send you abroad to go study journalism? Why would you want to do journalism? You know. And bear in mind that I was like the family's black sheep so my sister was an engineer my brother was a doctor my older sister was a banker my younger sister would later, would later become a stockbroker and then there or there i was saying that i wanted to be a writer like what the hell does that even mean so that conversation didn't go well because of that i ended up getting held back a year so instead of starting university in 2007 i started in 2008 so i started at the university of hull in 2008 i was i studied creative writing and media, culture, and society. Very much to my parents' displeasure, but they felt like, you know what? This guy, you know, he's, he's a lost cause. Let's just give him what he wants, whatever. Like, they, they had given up. I, I was and am the family's black sheep. Like, let's be very clear about that. I was and I still am. Because they didn't understand what I was doing at the time, and they still don't understand it. Like, why on earth, <laughs> of all the things you could use this brain to do in this life, why on earth would it be this thing? So after I finished... Um, the plan was initially to get a job at BBC, then marry my girlfriend, have a have a kid, buy get a dog, like live happily ever after. Obviously, that didn't happen. So I came back to Nigeria in twenty thirteen and I basically started afresh, like afresh, like from scratch because like my career in the UK didn't take off the way I hoped it for it to. It just didn't happen for me. So. Um, I, after my youth service, I started off at a newspaper called Vanguard, Vanguard newspaper. And I didn't spend up to a month there. And then the editor actually told me that, look, I've seen the quality of what you write. And we know that within six months, you're going to leave. And we don't like having too much employee turnover. So what I'm going to do for you is I'm going to help you. I'm going to hook you up with a place where, 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 where you're going to be, be better paid. He thought he was doing me a favor. I mean, he was doing me a favor because it was a financial favor. So he hooked me up with a friend of his who ran a PR agency. So which is how come I ended up starting my substantive career in PR, right? So most people typically move from journalism into communications and PR. I moved from communications and PR back into journalism. So I, I started off in communications and PR at the company called BHM. I was there for just under two years. By the time I left, I was head of content and... I left to set up my own content creation, my own copywriting agency, which didn't really take off. And then after like, a, like nearly a year of floundering about, I got the opportunity to join Channels TV. 
So there was a there was a political satire show called uh, The Other News. If you've ever watched The Daily Show with Trevor Noah, uh, The Other News is like a Nigerian version of that. In fact, we directly based The Other News on the format of The Daily Show, but it was strictly Nigerian content. And it was quite successful. At our peak, we had over one and a half million weekly viewers. It was quite a successful show. I was the I was the, I was the first writer actually on the show, and actually hired out the rest of the writing team, which I'm still proud of. Um, the show, like as a result of my involvement on that show, like other doors started to open. I was featured in a New Yorker magazine. I was invited to take part in the U.S. International Business Leadership Program. I was featured in a Netflix documentary. You know, a couple of doors here and they began to open. And then I started freelancing for like foreign um, publications like uh, uh, Yahoo Finance, those sorts of things. I was just basically doing like short news and opinion pieces for them. The money was good, but that's that's what I was doing for a while. And then I, I, had, a, I had like five or six of them that I was doing that kind of work for. So I was doing maybe like, I was living in Lagos at the time and I was doing like three to $4,000 a month, which... To me, that was a that was big money, and I was like, I was living my best life at the time. That was like 20, 2017 going into early twenty nineteen, and then I got the opportunity to start doing some work in Nigeria. Because bear in mind that nobody in Nigeria knew who I was at this point in time. I think I had like seven hundred followers on Twitter or something. Like I was a total nobody in Nigeria. I was known in in the international space, but nobody in Nigeria knew who the hell I was. And then I got the opportunity in March. April, sorry, 2019, to start doing some work in Nigeria. Uh, a daily newspaper in Nigeria called Business, they reached out to me. And they said they've been following my work and they want that, that like, their readership is kind of aging a bit and they're trying to attract a new, a, like a younger demographic to like refresh their, their, their because basically if your readership is aging out, then that means your publication is dying. And that means your advert revenue is going to start drying up or whatnot. So they're trying to lower the average age of their readership. And they're trying to do that by getting more youthful voices to write in the, in the paper. So I started doing an, an opinion column for them, which was once a week. And it became very successful. It became the most read column in the newspaper. And that opened even more doors. I did some work for CNN Africa, then just little doors here and there. But none of this was investigative work. This was just like analysis and opinion stuff. And then in August, 2019, I did my first ever investigative story. Um, I, I have a cousin who was working at, he had just left his job at a, he was, he's a doctor. He had just left his job at a hospital in a town called Badagri in Lagos. And he had this like really awful story about how the hospital was like under equipped, the, the taps weren't running. Sometimes doctors carried out operations using their phone flashlights because the, 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 the diesel for the generators wasn't supplied, so there was no electricity. Just really horrible stuff. And he put me in contact with a couple of doctors and nurses there, and I spoke to them. So I did what I, I didn't think of it as an investigative story. I thought I just thought of it as a story, like a human interest story. But I guess it, would, it was technically my first ever investigative story journalism my first ever attempt at investigative journalism and it had some kind of an impact because prior to the story the maternal mortality rate for um, deli for deliveries done using um, c-section was four in ten after the story then the Lagos state health service commission came and started doing inspections they fired a few people and that figure came down to about two in ten which is still too much but actual lives were saved and after that, then the light bulb went off above my head that, wow, something I did save somebody's life. I want to keep down. I want to do more of this. So um, a lady called Mercy Abank, who runs a platform called Newswire, newswirengr.com, she then reached out in September, which was the following month. And she had this story that she, she had already done the groundwork on the story. She had already done the actual investigation. She just wanted me to write it because she liked the way I wrote. So... I read what she had, I thought I could do more with it. So I asked her for all the material that she had, the victim she had spoken to, because it was a story about um, this thing called the Abuja raids, where young women were, were getting kidnapped off the streets of Abuja on, on suspicion of being prostitutes, right? Because prostitution was, um, was an illegal gray area. So basically, um, depending on who was the FCT minister, it could be designated as legal or illegal, depending on what side of the bed they woke up on. 
So she brought this story to my attention and I ended up writing it in my own voice. I think that was the first time I ever did a David Hundane investigative story, like using the voice that you are kind of familiar with now. And, and it went like, it, it went super viral, first of all. It, everybody read it. And then it apparently had so much of an impact that the following month, one of the ladies who was named in the report, because she had taken the FCT minister to court over what happened to her, she won her case. And in the ruling, which was delivered in the FCT high court by Justice Binta Yako, my, my my story was actually mentioned in the ruling. So again, that's like from the moment that happened, it just felt like, okay, you people don't know what you've just done. Like you people are not ready for me now because this is all I'm going to do from now on. So that was like late 2019. So it was like January 2020 that I then decided, okay, this is what I am doing. I'm gonna um cut down on the amount of freelancing that I do for all these other publications because they take up a lot of my time. And I'm gonna start focusing on this. The money wasn't <laughs> I was getting paid twenty thousand naira for a story. That's and I was doing five stories a month. That's hundred thousand naira a month. That's that's about in today's currency in dollars. That's roughly that's about one hundred and twenty dollars a month. <laughs> it was nothing, but for me, it wasn't about money. It was about the fact that oh my god, I'm finally getting to do this thing I've always wanted to do. So. So I did that uh, up until November 2020 when I, you know, I eventually punched my ticket and I had to flee the country because the story that I was doing was finally going to get me arrested. I had been threatened with arrest once, but I hadn't been arrested before. And funny story, the person who threatened me was a family member. But he's a, he's a, like, he's a member of the security services. He actually threatened me at, at a family, <laughs> family event with a smile on his face. Threatened me, he touched my glasses, and he was like, "Have you been to the the SSS headquarters in Abuja? The SSS is the State State Security Services, Nigeria Secret Police." He said, "Have you been to the SSS headquarters in Abuja? That it goes seven stories on the ground, and that if you're in one of those underground cells, you won't see anything with your glasses." And then he walked off. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's kind of like a very short and abridged story of how I moved from A to B. What made you an exceptional writer? Um, I think because during my childhood, I wasn't really allowed to have much of a childhood. Um, my parents were Jehovah's Witnesses. So, and if you know anything or two about Jehovah's Witnesses, um, they, it's a basically, it's basically, it's, it's, a, it's a religious cult, for lack of a better term. And you are not allowed as much as possible, you're not supposed to associate with anyone who is not from within the religious cult. So I wasn't really allowed to have like friends, like my friends couldn't, my friends at school, I actually had to hide the fact that I had friends at school from my parents and they weren't allowed to like visit me at home. I wasn't allowed to visit them. I wasn't allowed to like have video games. We weren't even allowed to have DSTV until I was like 15 or something. You understand? Like we, so the only thing, the only escape that I had at home was books and reading material and we had a ton <laughs> that's the one good thing i have to say about my parents like there was a like a surplus of reading material we had a, the the family library i'm not exaggeration had nothing nothing less than a thousand books inside it and they, in addition to the books Dad used to, every week or every month, he used to, every edition of um, Newsweek, Reader's Digest, uh, Time Magazine, BBC Focus on Africa, back when it used to be a print magazine, um, Tell Magazine, you wouldn't know it's a Nigerian magazine, just, was, and then all the daily newspapers. So there was just, const my head is just constantly being, there was nothing else to do. There was no TV to watch. There were no video games to play. There were no friends to play with. And I was a middle child. So the three oldest kids had like their own little clique. And then my younger sister, who was four years younger, was like the last born. She was in my mom. So I was just by myself all the time. So literally all I had was just books, reading material, and my imagination. And I think um, the, more, the more you read, the better you write. It's just that simple. The more you take in, the more you'll be able to put out. Because especially when you're reading stuff by authors like Terry Pratchett. 
you know, really witty stuff. You you pick up things subconsciously, and then later on, when you are writing, you find yourself doing things that they did. So it's almost like you're copying them, but you're copying from like you're borrowing from different people, and then you are turning it into your own voice, into your own style. And that's how, before you know it, when you do that for a few years, you become you build your own unique voice and style, and then you become recognized as a good writer. So even though I, I I certainly don't recommend having a Jehovah Witness childhood for anyone. It wasn't fun, but <laughs> I have to credit <laughs> it. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have a career without it. You wouldn't probably I mean, have yeah. had a career without it. Yeah. Wow. 